Which Baltimore Ravens free agents could the team decide to keep and who could they decide to let go of? We talk about that, get into the Chuck Clark trade, talk about Lamar Jackson, the Ravens coaching hires, and so much more coming up next year on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker, Ravens Wire, and we're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for tuning in with us and making us your first listen each and every day. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms, including in video form over on YouTube. And we are back here. We're going to be talking about a lot today. I know we haven't had really a chance with the Lamar Jackson situation to dive too, too far into free agency. So today, Kaji Esmail, former Baltimore Ravens wide receiver, Super Bowl champion, is going to be joining us. We're going to be talking about the Ravens' own free agents, who the Ravens could decide to keep, who they could decide to let go of, because there are some names that are really interesting names. We'll talk about all of those here today. We'll also talk about the Chuck Clark trade, the Ravens trading Chuck Clark to the Jets. We'll talk about Lamar Jackson, the Ravens coaching hire. So it's a ton to dive into on today's show here. And if you hear this on YouTube and video form, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel as well. We also did a live stream here on YouTube about the Chuck Clark trade, a reaction to that. So if you haven't checked that out, highly recommend you do that. And in audio form, thank you so much for tuning in an audio form, whether you're on your way to work, on your way from work, wherever, however you're listening. Thank you so much for tuning in here today. Be sure to follow along wherever you get your podcasts in audio form. Without any further ado, though, let's now dive into our conversation with Kaji Ismail. We are back here today. It is with our Purple Friday guest in for Baltimore Ravens wide receiver and Super Bowl champion, Kadri is smiling. We've been talking for so long about when is that domino going to fall with Lamar? And I know it wasn't the full domino, but we did get the franchise tag. The Ravens trade Chuck Clark, obviously some coaching hires in there. Plenty of stuff going on this week for the Ravens. I mean, the beat goes on. Obviously, other teams are going to be making moves and hiring and rearranging their coaching staff, free agency. The Ravens are no different. They have to go out there and assemble a coaching staff look at the roster and figure out how that roster is going to look to be competitive. And oh, by the way, yeah, Lamar Jackson is your franchise quarterback and you put the non-exclusive tag on Lamar, which pushes him now into the position of, all right, you think you are worth all that? Then go ahead out there and prove it. So they're going to let others kind of set the tone in the market. And here we are. Yeah, and I, I want to get your opinion on Lamar. We'll talk about Lamar and Chuck Clark and all that in the final segment. But today, again, as I've kind of talked about on the shows before the week here, I barely had any time to kind of dive into other things outside of Lamar because it is taking up such a huge chunk of our shows because it's it's that big of a topic where if Lamar stays, if he goes, it alters the dynamic of the team either which way. But today I wanted to kind of dive into just which are the Ravens' own free agents, guys who are set to hit free agency, should they stick around with and who should they end up letting go? Now, Q, I know we did this last year. People really liked it, so I wanted to do it again with you here today. And it seems like, obviously, the, the big two names were Lamar Jackson and Roquan Smith. Now, the Lamar situation isn't resolved just yet, but he at least is on the franchise tag for now. Roquan Smith, five years, $100 million. He's all set in place. So I want to start off first offense, and I think the biggest offensive player to talk about is Ben Powers. Now, I feel like a lot of people feel like the writing's on the wall for Ben Powers in terms of him probably leaving. At this point, it just depends because of the Lamar situation. Everything ties back to Lamar. If they didn't have this $32.4 million cap hit right now, which, by the way, is 14.5% of their cap, maybe they could find a way to bring a guy like Ben Powers back. He played really well, played his way into a really big contract, but it seems like, Q, at least to me, he might have played his way out of Baltimore with a bigger contract. What do you think about that? Well, typically when you look at guards, they're not really high-ticketed free agent guys that you would say, oh, we definitely need to keep him on our team. Of all the positions in this whole landscape of the NFL and salary cap and everything, it's the guard that kind of gets you know poo-pooed on. Maybe the guard and the fullback. But primarily, guard traditionally is not going to get 
too big of a deal. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you look at Coletio Simile or, you know, uh, Ben Grubbs, you know, guys who have come through here and have played really well on the offensive line. I mean, heck, you know, Ryan Jensen was a center, but, you know, even that he got paid. So obviously the Ravens, they develop guys and do well with it. I think Ben Powers is in a position where you got more than one team going after you, hint, hint. Well, then that's where you're going to go ahead and probably drive up a really good price. And I think that's uh, kudos to him. And if that happens, then I think it's on to the next guy, whoever that next guy might certainly be, whether he be on a roster or whether he be on someone else's roster to fill the void that's left by Powers. Yeah, and I mean, another guy also, Kevin Zeitler, I think his deal was, what, three years, $27.5 million, if I'm not mistaken. So, again, for a proven, like, Kevin Zeitler, Pro Bowl guy, been snubbed these past two seasons, even that type of deal. But then it becomes, you're right, if there's a bidding war that goes on, I don't think the Ravens can get into a bidding war with their situation right now where they just don't really know what path they're going to have to go down with Lamar. And they have Ben Cleveland waiting in the wings. Maybe this is his year to do that. Maybe they add a mid-round guard or sign some veteran option there. So we'll see. I mean, if I had to predict, I would probably say that Powers leaves, but I think at the same time, they will probably be able to at least give him some sort of offer. How close that is to other teams, who who knows at this point. But sticking on the offensive line, Q, Jawan James is an interesting one. Obviously suffered the torn Achilles with Denver a couple of years ago. Baltimore decides to bring him in that offseason on a two-year deal. And then he goes down with a season-ending injury again in the first week of the season. It feels like the Ravens like him as a depth option. They like what he brings. But if he can't stay on the field, obviously he can't contribute in that way. Do you feel like this could be potentially like a one-year minimum contract, get tackle depth back? I think James is still, if you're looking at him as a backup option, one of the top ish backup options if he's a healthy guy but do you even waste the roster spot on a guy that can't stay healthy at that point if you're Baltimore are you saying that's a waste of a roster spot or do you just think that maybe they can bring back his depth you know one thing you normally would have is a draft pick a draft pick as far as you know multiple ones and that kind of gives you a little bit of cushion when it comes to guys like Juwan James I think you know for what he is looking like it's only five draft picks. He could be that guy that's like, all right, you know, he kind of knows our system. Hey, he could be that swing tackle. Okay, you know, let, let's let's roll a dice. I think he would be a guy that, in my mind, would fit that category because he's not really that high-ticketed guy that's going to really eat up a lot of cap, uh, salary cap space. Right, and that's the key here. It's for where the Ravens are. Can they get guys back on cheap deals? Can they bring them in on a deal that – They don't have to make all these extensions or restructures or cuts. You can find depth that way, especially guys who are familiar with your system. I think that's a plus. But I think one of the most intriguing free agents the Ravens have, Q, is Josh Oliver. Oliver burst onto the scene last year, obviously, as a run blocker, had some moments as a pass catcher, too. The Ravens are set at tight end, I think, both with or without Oliver. They have Mark Andrews, Isaiah Likely, and Charlie Kohler should be able to take on bigger roles next year. But, you know, we can't just cast aside what Oliver did in 2022 because he was a big part of their offense. Do you think that bringing back Oliver, if you can get him on like a two year, eight million, two year, $10 million deal, is that something you would do if you're the Ravens? Or would you rather give those opportunities and give those snaps to your younger guys like a likely or a cold? You know, it's it's hard to say in this particular case because there is that upside. There is that commitment that they had to him. Um, they moved on, you know, from um, goodness gracious. Who did they move on from? The guy from Delaware. Oh, Nick Boyle. Man, Nick Boyle. I feel bad that I don't remember Nick Boyle's name just right off. That just rolls off my tongue. Whatever happened to Bully Ball? No, let me stop. Let me not even go there. But the point I'm making is is that, yeah, you know, like what have you done for me lately? And the what have you done for me lately is that Josh Oliver really came in and uh, unseated Nick Boyle, which I didn't think what would happen, but he did. And they played well enough. You know, there were some games where should, certainly should have played better. Um, but I think that, you know, for what he offers and brings to the table – you know, if, if this is a scenario where you can have quality depth and and recognize his veteran savvy, keep him on the team. I don't see why not. 
But at the same time, yeah, you know, it, this, he could be a camp casualty more than anything, or he could be a scenario where, you know, you, you trade him because you got so much depth at tight end and you know that you've developed him well and other teams can cover him and, you know, you could put it together a package uh, with Oliver included in it. Yeah, and all these guys, Q, aren't like they're going to get five-year, $80 million deals. You know, these are going to be guys you're able to re-sign, probably pretty cost-effective contracts. I think the question for a lot of these guys becomes, one, is a team going to overpay for someone? But two, do you want to give snaps elsewhere? Do you want to give younger guys opportunity? So that for tight end is an interesting part there. Then two other guys I'm kind of intrigued about, Demarcus Robinson and Justice Hill. It feels like Demarcus Robinson – really bought into the Baltimore culture. It feels like he enjoys being with the team is kind of posted on social media that almost like, Oh, he's going to be back for sure. But Mm -hmm. who who knows at this point, then justice Hill, he played really well, burst onto the scene, a guy who, you know, kind of had the injury situation last year. And then this past year played, I think really well, looked really, really good for them in that role that he had for them. Do you see either of those guys back? For Justice Hill, I think, again, similar to Josh Oliver, that he, you know, got multiple opportunities, chance after chance, um, you know, for the most part, made the most of his opportunities. I think it was the Buccaneers game where he got hot and then all of a sudden he got an injury and it was kind of like, dang it, and hurt his hamstring. Um, but he did. When he was in there, he did. He he showed up and, you know, for the most part, showed up. Didn't have as many as the the big time explosive runs as I would have liked, but he's more than capable, more than being a a reliable back. However, could be one of those scenarios where, you know, running back is, is a commodity, which you can go out there and get a late round pick and he can flourish a la what the Kansas city chiefs did. And, um, their run to the super bowl and being super bowl champions. I mean, had a rookie at running back, you know? So, I think ultimately he gets an opportunity, but you know what? I'm not really sitting there high if if it's like, yeah, we need him. You you're fortunate to have him, but he's fortunate to be on the team. I think in what is the other gentleman's name? Demarcus Robinson. Demarcus Robinson. I think for Demarcus Robinson, yeah, he was uh, traded uh, for. I think anytime a guy is traded for, it just seems as though. You know, they want to get back their investment, if you will. I think he shows strong flashes. I think with Munkin's offense, I think he can do more. And it's a matter of them giving him the opportunity to do more. Uh, but, yeah, he's, he's kind of like a really strong, solid third wide receiver, I would put him as. Yeah, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think they signed him. I don't think they traded for him. But what ha- I think what happened was... That's right. You're, yeah, he, he, was a, he was actually released yeah he was released by the Raiders thank you my apologies and then he was picked up yeah um but with that said though yes to be accurate and fair uh Demarcus Robinson you know they they signed him they brought him aboard they thought that you know they needed some more depth which ultimately came to be towards the end of the year um but yeah like I said in Munkin's offense I think he has a chance to really flourish and blossom yeah and to me I think that by the end of the year, DeMarcus Robinson was your number one. I think if you have him as your number five, it's it's a much different conversation. Whereas a depth piece, I like DeMarcus Robinson. As a top two option, hmm. I, I think you need more <laughs> in terms of what you can do there. But other guys just looking down the list, Q, just to, to round it out. Sammy Watkins, Kenyon Drake, th- those, those guys to me, I don't see either of those coming back. But in the event of the restricted free agents, you have Tyler Huntley, who I think has been – a solid option for him. Tristan Cologne is someone who's been a solid center depth option. The Tyler Huntley situation is interesting. I mean, what do you think happens there? The Tyler Huntley scenario, um, it was interesting because Lamar wasn't around uh, throughout camp and stuff and uh, the OTAs and offseason. You know, he developed a tendonitis with his shoulder. You could see where when he first came into the game against uh, the Denver Broncos, he looked good, but then he, he started faltering as – uh, the the rest of the year went on and he had to take more of the role of practice as well as play. Uh, clearly, the injury he had in Pittsburgh uh, kind of did him uh, in even further. So durability is there. Arm 
talent is there when it's healthy. You can't overthrow him. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those scenarios where, again, it's a new coordinator, so he's going to be on um, brand new ground. It's not like he has an advantage over another uh, potential free agent. I think he's going to be a scenario where they can more than likely bring him back because they appreciate what he brings to the table. But uh, at the same time, you know, if, if someone outplays him, they bring in another guy or they draft another guy, um, someone outplays him. I think that's a different different case. Yeah. And I think, you know, in terms of all of the tenders that could happen with the, the a restricted free agent, you know, what tag or what tender they give, that could also have an impact on what happens in the situation there. But coming up, we'll move over to the defensive side of the ball, talking a bit of Marcus Peters and Justin Houston and so much more still coming up here on Locked on Ravens. But first, this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. And if you're looking for a delicious treat with all all the fat and calories, then you have to try Built Bar. I know for me, my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. And if you're like me, where you want to eat a little healthier, but don't want to compromise the taste, then I've got just a thing for you in Built. And with Built Healthy is actually tasty. They're so delicious. You won't actually think they're good for you because they do taste that good. And what makes them so good is for starters, they're covered in 100% grilled chocolate and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and coconut almond. They only have 130 calories, four grams of sugar, a whopping 17 grams of protein. And I don't even need to wait around to get a box. You guys have been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick them up on a four bar box of cookies and cream double chocolate or coconut puffs and if you're close to a sam's club run in there and grab a 30 bar box of hip flavors such as brownie batter and churro get your hands on a boat bar you can thank me later we are back here our second segment of locked on ravens with kaji ismail i am kevin ostriker and in, in q the defensive side of the ball is one that's interesting for the ravens obviously had a great year defensively in 2022 but you still got to build and you still got to bring some of those pieces back the ravens did that with roquan smith but the big, and honestly, the biggest free agent left for the Ravens at this point is Marcus Peters. Now, Peters mm. had, I'd call it a pretty up and down year after coming off of the ACL. And in reality, Q, the Ravens had so many guys coming off of major injuries. There was bound to be one or two guys that maybe didn't respond the way they thought they would. Like, you know, we saw J.K. Dobbins go out there and just be a beast. Like, he was yeah. out there beasting on people. Gus Edwards looked good for the most part. Ronnie Stanley looked really good. Marcus Peters, on the other hand, I feel like it took him a little bit of time mm -hmm. and struggled a little bit coming off that injury. So to me, my stance, and I want to get your opinion, is bringing back Marcus Peters, this isn't like a $10 million a year guy that I would bring back for the Ravens at this point, especially with their cap situation. But if you can get him on a $5 million or $6 million per year deal, I feel like that might be your best bet. But would you, Q, pay that $10 million range for Peters? I would try to make it spicy as far as you know some incentives. Uh, but he, he was a spark, you know, he epitomized the whole flow of, you know, play like a Raven. It wasn't like he was some buster. Now I know what you're saying. We're, we're expecting Marcus Peters, the one that, you know, picking off passes, uh, against Cincinnati, taking it to the house with ease. Uh, that's what we want. Uh, you know, when he first came aboard, but now when you look at Marcus Peters, yeah, there were some games where, I thought his his run support and his timeliness of uh, action and, and play was was phenomenal. Um, I thought that you know there were times where yeah he got caught peeking in the backfield and uh, unfortunately you know balls were caught on him. But I think he's a, a really good commodity. It depends on even from a draft pick aspect of things. I know the Ravens drafted some guys last year that they weren't really. Uh, satisfied with as far as their instant play. But I think this is, again, a young man's league. I think if you incentivize him, he likes it here. You like him. Uh, I know him and Eric DaCosta and his agent, they're all talking. So those are good signs. I think, you know, keeping him, uh, like I said, with an incentive-laden deal to show him some love will really be cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with that 100%. And I think also – with Peters, you mentioned it. I think he would take a team-friendly deal to, to stay in Baltimore because it feels like he loves it here, as you talked about. And he kind of said that the Ravens 
like saved his love of the game, really helped him reignite that love for the game. So look, maybe he gets an offer from another team. He can't refuse and he goes somewhere else. But at this point, I think if you're able to bring back Peters and maybe draft a stud corner in the first round, I'm feeling pretty confident in that room again, because you also have the depth pieces like a Brandon Stevens and Jalen Armour Davis and Pepe Williams, some of those guys who can grow into their roles and not necessarily be thrust into something. But let's let's talk Justin Houston, Q. This is a guy, I, I am a big Justin Houston guy. I wanted him all the way back in 2018 when he went to the Colts. He obviously did work over there in Indianapolis, came over to Baltimore, had a, a scorching start to the year this past year, and then we didn't really hear from him in the back half of the season. Finished with nine, nine, nine and a half sacks. One of the two didn't get the 10, which he would have gotten incentives if he did. But this is a guy right now, you know, he's 34, still productive. I think in a pass rushing role, he'd be a really good guy to bring back. Obviously, the veteran leadership, the production is still there. You don't want to overwork him and overuse him at, at this age, at this stage of his career. But I think, if, again, if it's later in the offseason, you still have a, a hole in that edge room. I think bringing back Justin Houston, you, you, you could do a lot worse. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think, again, you look at Justin Houston and the phenomenal leadership, uh, what he brings as far as locker room presence. And, yeah, the nine and a half sacks. I mean, that's a lot of production there. Um, <clears throat> Tom Brady's still probably saying, I want to either come out of retirement to throw some more touchdown passes and see if I still got it. Oh, God, Justin Houston's there. No, I think I'm going to stay in retirement. I think at the same time, when you look at um, – the team makeup, um, it's one of those cases where like an Adafi Owe where, you know, you and I, we've both been not necessarily critical, but we're like, we're just expecting more from a first rounder. I mean, that's fair enough. Um, but, you know, you got a Jabo. Um, I just think that Justin, it's good. It's strong. It's, it's a, 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 a good solid fit, but, I wouldn't necessarily bring him back maybe to once either close to the season or even once the season starts and just kind of see from there, but not necessarily need, need a Justin Houston right off the bat to uh, go through training camp and then obviously the uh, regular season. Right. And I don't think like if the Ravens don't bring him back, I don't think it's all the Ravens. Are, they can't win a Super Bowl without Justin Houston because they even, you know, Tyus Bowser, another guy in that edge room who is, I think, yeah. coming back from his injury and he'll get a full offseason now of work. But for what Houston can bring, as you mentioned, veteran leadership and, and the production is still there. But I think you still do need more in that room because what if OA doesn't take a year three leap? What if Ajabo can't? be a, a year two guy and he has to have another year because essentially this is his rookie year coming up right now because he only played in a couple of games mm -hmm. in that, and look played really well at a strip sack on Joe Burrow like that's a great mm -hmm. play for him something to build on but you have a couple of young guys kind of a middle middle-ish veteran in Tyus Bowser so I guess if you want to go up and have that veteran leadership Houston's familiar with everything that goes on there so I think it'd be cool to bring him back but again it's not like they need 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 to bring him back there but let's talk about Kyle Fuller Kyle Fuller expected to be a big part of the Ravens defense. I know kind of struggled throughout training camp a little bit, did have an interception in the preseason, but got injured in week one and, and was out for the year. Would you take a flyer, maybe a minimum, a minimum flyer on Kyle Fuller and maybe see what he could do? Kick the tires, see how it is. Look at my rookies. If I need them, great. If not, nah, I think that's one where I'll move on. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like, imperative i feel like they can find other corner depth they re-signed daryl worley mm -hmm. we've talked about the young guys they have they're gonna take at least one i think corner in this draft so if you have room for him maybe in training camp you have room for him, maybe he can be kind of on the bubble in camp as, as a depth body a depth piece but i think you know kyle fuller's not again going to contribute to your super bowl like he's not going to be all oh, kyle fuller's the piece to go out there and win a Super Bowl. <laughs> but another guy, Q, JPP. JPP came in. The Ravens end up signing him. We talked about that edge room a little bit. Pierre Paul can play both outside and inside at this point in his career. But a veteran who I think provided some solid snaps for them, especially as they were kind of working through when is Tyus Bowser coming back, when is yeah. David Ajabo coming back. They rotated him in, and he played, I think, decently well. Didn't light the world on fire, but I thought played a solid enough role. Is maybe that someone again you bring in on maybe a minimum type deal just for depth in that room? I would love to actually have him back. I think again, he might be one of those guys where you don't necessarily need to bring him back 
uh, to, you know, jump in a training camp type mode, but I, I really like him. I think he's, uh, he's the guy, like some of the plays and, 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 and run stuffing and run stopping and, and just, you know, rallying to the ball, um, mindset, you know, he really is like the real deal. I don't, I don't see this as a, a bad thing. If <clears throat> you bring him back over a Justin Houston. Yeah, it, it might come down to one of the two if the Ravens want to bring back someone who's familiar with their defense right now. And then other guys on the defensive side of the ball who are slated to hit for agency here, Stephen Means, Vince Beagle, two guys who were in training camp, separate season ending injuries, injuries either before the season yeah. or in, in week one there. You also have, or I think Stephen Means is actually week two, but then restricted for agency, two interesting ones, Kristen Welch and Geno Stone. I think Geno Stone is someone the Ravens should definitely look to bring back. He's was He played very well in the role when Marcus Williams went down. Kristen Welch is someone I think for depth. I don't think he cost you too much. And I, I don't think Geno Stone would cost you a ton too. Could you see both those guys back? Yeah, because it's called special teams. <laughs> and them dudes, they would primarily make the team based upon their prowess of special teams. And I think you know, Gino obviously he got in. Don't don't get me wrong, but I'm saying now that you don't have a Chuck Clark, I think a Gino Stone would provide that necessary depth uh, on a game day roster, um, both special teams as well as playing in the secondary. Yeah, speaking of special teams, Nick Moore, the long snapper and exclusive rights for agent. You know, I'll, I'll expect I expect him back. He Pro Bowler, by the way, Nick Moore. So that's <laughs> someone special teams wise. We got to put the special teams love in there too. But you mentioned Chuck Clark, Hugh. We'll talk about that trade coming up in our final segment. We'll mention Lamar Jackson, talk about his franchise tag. The Ravens making some coaching hires. So be sure to stay tuned. Still, a lot to dive into on the show. We are back. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still chopping it up with Kadri Ismael. And let's start with Lamar first. We'll do Lamar, then we'll do Chuck Clark. Lamar got the non-exclusive franchise tag. There's plenty of conversation about what it could be. Could there be a last-minute extension? Could they just tag and trade him? Would it be a franchise tag? And then in that, it was exclusive or non-exclusive. But what was the reaction when you found out Lamar got the non-exclusive franchise tag? And how do you like the move? Like originally, I, I was all for the exclusive franchise tag. Like, hey, they're they're they, you know having good good you know flow and 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 feeling comfortable and confident that they're going to, you know, in the in the the twelfth hour get everything done. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. They didn't get it done. Uh, it was one of those cases where the Ravens are feeling, and this must be you know right from Steve Rashadi. Uh, you know what? We'll we'll let the market set the tone, and this isn't necessarily a surprise because you know my former teammate when he was up for his contract and Ray Lewis, you know what? He was like frustrated by some of the comments that Steve Bashotti made, but then at the same time he kind of made some comments on his own and the back and forth. But that's that's the negotiation. I think that's that's the uh, the nuts and bolts of it, meat and potatoes of it. The off season. You know, there's a time for play and there's a time for pay. And that offseason, is, it's where you're you're trying to put your best uh, negotiation hat on and, and tell them why without you, they just aren't that same team. And I think that's something where, you know, bigger picture wise, uh, Lamar, he's in a position where he's in the thick of it now because is it going to be another team? What does that other team you know, look like as far as what they want to do, potentially giving up first round picks and then at the same time locking in a deal. If it is a fully guaranteed deal, then, you know, uh, the precedent, um, there's so much to be said with the precedent of Kirk Cousins as well as Sean Watson. Let's see if, if this is a situation where, you know, in fact, the non-exclusive works for him or against him. Yeah, and you know it is a risk I think by the Ravens to let them go out there and talk to these other teams, but it feels like they feel confident enough in their offer that another team either would just come close to it anyway, and the Ravens yeah. would say, "Well, we offered you more than that, or right on that anyway. Just you know, we'll match that. It's fine." Or that a team wouldn't go and offer him a fully guaranteed contract plus give up two first round picks, which is what it is, other than an exclusive tag. But then all these teams come out. Q and the reports come out about these teams, the Falcons and the Raiders and the Commanders and the Panthers about how they're not going to pursue Lamar Jackson. 
And so part of the conversation is, look, I get if some teams are kind of worried about, you know, spending all their cap space and giving up two first round picks. But at the same time, I mean, it's Lamar Jackson we're talking about. And a talent like Lamar Jackson, I know he's not a free agent right now, technically not unrestricted, but teams don't usually get the opportunity to go out there and even just talk to a guy, get a feel for what Lamar Jackson could be looking for. I mean, were you surprised by all those reports coming out? Is, is it fishy to you? I mean, what was your reaction when you, when you found out and heard that? Yeah, I was really, you know, you know, kind of frustrated and disappointed. And, you know, as a former player, you you look at what the, the, the guys did before you. And you look at, you know, how uh, from a collective bargaining standpoint, you hope that um, there are some things that you can get as an organization. When I say organization, as a union, um, you hope you can get more. And, you know, there, there's that pie that seems to continue to grow year in and year out. And it is one of those cases where the owners dug their heels in and said that they're not going to um, give up the ground of the guaranteed contract. And so I think the the thing is with all of this, with free agency and, and, and what it looks like, the landscape of it all, I think, you know, unrestricted free agency is a bonus. It's awesome. It's great. But when it comes down to contracts, when it comes down to setting the tone and precedent, you know, it is – it's one of those things where I'm, I'm kind of sad and disappointed um, that it really hadn't been resolved. And it looks like it's more of a collusion as uh, aspect of things um, because Lamar is, is in his prime. Everyone wants a quarterback. He has proven himself. Sure. People are saying, look, that was then this is now the, the now what have you done for me lately uh, it's been two years of injury. And so, you know, are we getting 2019 Lamar? Or are we getting 2022 Lamar with a PCL? Those are the little, you know, throw shade at Lamar type comments. But he is absolutely, you know, box office, amazing player. And I think it is, it is, it really is fishy when you look at, you know, some of the teams and this, the quickness of the reports. Although, could be an insider trying to make a name for themselves and then basically saying, well, yeah, you know, I just inquired within whatever general manager and that general manager hopefully is holding it close to the vest and not trying to give away their hand or what they're really thinking as far as, you know, negotiations. But that's what it is. It, it's are we willing to do the work for the Baltimore Ravens? Or is this really truly collusion? And I think it's truly collusion. And it all just happened, I think, so fast and, and so quickly where it was boom, Atlanta, boom, Carolina, boom, Washington, where it's like all this stuff came out at once. And you're right. These could just be reports. And, and in that meaning that they're either not true or things can change. But, you know, Desmond Ritter, Lamar Jackson, Sam Darnold, Lamar Jackson, no disrespect to those guys, obviously. But Lamar makes your team so much better. And I, I hear you and I hear what people are saying about the injuries and well, why should Lamar get a fully guaranteed deal when he's been injured for the past two seasons or the end of the year. But I mean, those injuries won't have happened in the pocket. I know people are saying, well, he's a running quarterback. And I say, well, the injuries didn't happen when he was running. He was, he was passing mm -hmm. when the injuries happened. And also franchise quarterbacks, Q just don't grow on trees. I mean, we've seen, we just saw Derek Carr get 150 million from the saints. We just saw Daniel Jones get 40 million per season from the Giants, if I if I had to pick, who am I giving forty million? And I, look, I know the guaranteed amounts; those weren't fully guaranteed deals. I didn't want to put that out there, but just in, in a vacuum, if you were going to say you have to either pay Daniel Jones or Lamar Jackson forty million per season, I'm picking Lamar ten times out of ten. If you have to pay Derek Carr or Lamar Jackson 50, 150 million per, per year or one hundred fifty million total, one hundred fifty million per year would be a lot. But I, I think I'd give Lamar Jackson ten times out of ten. So I think Lamar, you know, he's not being greedy by asking for what he believes he's worth. The organizations, I understand the fully guaranteed aspect of things where that eats into your cap. It, it hurts you from a cap perspective. But in this situation, we're here because I don't think the Ravens maximize Lamar's contract, rookie contract to the fullest extent in terms of pass catching weapons. And now the Ravens have to maneuver around. If you give Lamar the franchise tag, he plays on that. If you give Lamar a long-term deal, 
you're going to have to find a way to get weapons in here now that Lamar doesn't have rookie contract and that window is gone. But let's move on. Let's talk about Chuck Clark a little bit here because this is a guy that obviously came in as a sixth round pick out of Virginia Tech in 2017, worked his way up into a very solid member of this defense. Clark gets traded to the New York Jets. A 2024 seventh round pick is the return. Essentially, he was salary dump, but the Ravens get something for him. Brian McFarland, the, the salary cap guy for the Ravens, does a lot of great work over Russell Street Report, said that the Ravens will save about $4.1 million with this move. These are, these are some of the things we'll see over these next couple of days and couple of weeks as the Ravens continue to try to get under that cap threshold. Uh, it felt like the writing was on the wall for Clark leaving Baltimore this offseason just based off of what they did last year with Kyle Hamilton and Marcus Williams and Clark literally saying you're a of the trade in the offseason, but it didn't end up getting granted. But, I mean, it, how badly does losing Chuck Clark hurt this defense in, in terms of the return? I mean, it's better than nothing, but obviously it's not exactly a fifth or a sixth. It's a seventh. Well, yeah, no, I, I think the fact that they got something um, was good. I think that now it's it's a matter of whether or not you can make something of it with your pick, with the the board being set, you know, however many um, players you see as an organization are the top, you know, 150 players and all the things. Um, it's interesting, too, because he was such a, a an, an incredibly – consistent player. Um, that's one of the things that I'll, you know, always remember about watching Chuck Clark play, you know, his leadership, the way in which he handled himself. Um, you know, Earl Thomas probably still sitting there like, man, yo, whew, Chuck Clark. Yeah, okay. Uh, if people remember when Chuck Clark was the one who gave them the confidence to be like, yeah, nah, there's a groove and there's a vibe there with him when he's on the field. That just simply wasn't there with Earl. But I digress. The point is, is that you developed a really good player and he came into his own and now you're still getting something for him, a late pick um, that hopefully will turn into another Chuck Clark late pick. Yeah, we know the Ravens love those mid, late round picks. They find gems with those. Obviously, Clark was one of them. So obviously, best of luck to, to Clark in the future. But the Ravens queue a couple of coaching hires over the course of this past week here. They hired, a, I think, a couple of really solid options here. Zanard Wilson, local guy, coming back to Maryland. He was the Eagles defensive backs coach. He's now the Ravens defensive backs coach. Then you have Greg Lewis, who was a former NFL wide receiver. You know, had that catch with Brett Favre in the playoffs with the Vikings that everybody talks about. He's now the Ravens wide receiver coach. And then Chuck Smith, kind of the, the Keith Williams hire of the defense for the Ravens. Works, worked independently with pass rushers and obviously was an all pro defensive end himself. How, how do you like those hires? Yeah, I, I think, you know, just the, the, the Greg Lewis one is a really good one. I think it is a scenario where him being in Kansas city, he's seen an awful lot as far as some of the nuances of route running and, and how to get open. Um, I think that's really super cool. But then you also look at what Chuck Smith brings to the table, like his pass rush, uh, school and and showing guys how to just refine their skill sets. You know, you work with some top notch guys. You work with guys like Von Miller. Um, really says an awful lot. You know, there's ways in which you can release off the line. Dafe Owe needs a guy like a Chuck Smith badly. Uh, so I think this is a great hire, and I thank Lewis as well. What a wonderful hire! Uh, for the wide receiving crew. Yeah, I think I think Baltimore's crushed it, this coaching cycle. Obviously, getting Todd Munkin in the building. He kind of reassigned Team Martin to quarterbacks coach. It seems like James Urban and Craig Versteeg and Keith Williams are going to stay within the organization. I don't think we know what their roles are going to be yet, but it feels like that's what's going to happen. So I think Baltimore did a really good job there. But Q, I appreciate you. Thanks so much for hopping on here. For agency, next time we talk, for agency will be in full swing. and Maybe a couple of signings will happen, some more moves. And I'll, I'll leave you with two things. One, the Ravens get no compensatory picks this year, something mm. nobody's heard of before. The Ravens always are compensatory pick laden, but no compensatory picks this year. And then two, our old friends, Darius Smith released or was requested. He requested his release from the Vikings. The Vikings said no. So that whole situation is something, but what could have been in Baltimore for the Ravens and Darius Smith? Yeah. Well, for him, I just think that uh, something must not have gone well for 
him to request his release. Uh, that's where, again, you, you have your agent because they can say whatever they want to say. You got your agent to buffer that whole uh, heated scenario. And at the same time, yeah, if you truly want to get away, then your agent can go shop around and see, look, man, why don't you just release us? We're going to have other opportunities elsewhere. Here's how this can happen. So you do have an advocate, but I absolutely wish him well, whatever his you know, ultimate um, scenario happens for him, whether he gets his release or whether he reluctantly or unreluctantly, however it is, stays with the Vikings. But uh, it is kind of a, an interesting situation to look to look at. Yeah, part 2.5 with the Ravens maybe coming up here. I know we talked about that move on an app in queue, but we'll see what happens this free agency cycle for the Ravens. But that's all I have for you here today on Locked On Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to like this video, subscribe on YouTube, follow along in audio form as well. When we get back here on Monday, we dive into a pre-free agency mock draft Monday, so be sure to stay tuned for that, and I'll see you back here on Monday.